think we're gonna get started. I want to hello everybody. It's good to see or to e see uh, everybody. Um, we've come to learn that actually doing these events in um, via Zoom has the advantage that many friends of the program can connect to these talks from uh, from afar, which is. Uh, which is an advantage. I'm Alejandro de la Fuente, and I'm the chair of the Cuba Studies Program at the David Rockefeller Center for uh, Latin American Studies here at Harvard. Um, and this is our first uh, meeting of the year, our first seminar of the year, and we are delighted to to welcome back, really, somebody who is from the from the house, because Esther is not, uh, although she is currently a professor of uh, literature at Brown University and Hispanic studies at Brown, Esther is really one of one of uh, of, of us. She obtained her PhD here at Harvard uh, a few years ago. Uh, I'm not going to say how many, and she's always been around. Uh, she has always been part of our community, of our intellectual community here. When I when I uh, when I started editing Cuban Studies, the journal Cuban Studies, uh, this was the first issue I edited. Uh, I don't know a few years ago. Um, one of the persons I immediately reached out to uh, to be part of the editorial or editorial board was uh, precisely uh, Professor Esther Whitfield. Um, I think in our world, because she has done some intriguing work on, uh, on, on Welsh and Welsh language in Latin America, <laughs> about which I know absolutely nothing. But I can, I can talk a little bit about her work on, on Cuban studies. Um, she has produced, I mean, she produced really one of the signature, uh, most important books on how the special period impacted cultural production in Cuba in the 1990s. That book is, um, is uh, Cuban Currency, the Dollar and Special Period Fiction, which was published in 2008, and which became one of those books that everybody who was interested, including social scientists, which is interesting, who typically don't read what comes uh, from scholars in the humanities, that was a book that sort of um, spilled over the traditional lines and that um, social scientists uh, paid um, attention to. And in that book, she asked the question of how the special period and Cuban globalization and dollarization uh, shaped cultural production and literary production uh, in Cuba, particularly during the 1990s, paying attention uh, especially to the literary work of three very important writers, Soe Valdez, uh, which I'm sure you know, um, Pedro Juan Gutierrez and Antonio Jose Ponte. And she also then went on to publish an, a critical edition of Ponte's uh, Un Arte de Hacer Ruinas, which I'm sure uh, you're, it's fam you're familiar, uh, you know this, uh, this work that also led later to uh, to a, to a documentary. Um, Esther is now working on something um, equally exciting, but completely different, which is, uh, which is about uh, how Guantanamo and the many layers and meanings of Guantanamo impact cultural production in Cuba. And um, she's working on a book project, the title or the working title of which is The New No Man's Land, Guantanamo's Literary Life. And her talk today, Guantanamo, Cuba, and the Arts is uh, based on that on that book, uh, a book that I very much look forward to reading when it's out, uh, Esther, and uh, perhaps we'll have a chance to present here uh, in the future and to, and to have a discussion about it. And with that, I'm just going to give the floor to my dear colleague, uh, Professor Esther Wilson. Thank you. Uh, Alejandro, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, it's really, <laughs> it's really wonderful to hear you talk about, uh, you know, the, my relationship with the center um, and you know Cuban studies, which I, I 
which has been very important to me, as, as I know you know. Uh, it's great to be back at the center. Alejandro was sort of polite in uh, <laughs> saying that I, I finished my dissertation at this center when it was in a different place. And I've uh, been related with, with people there for a long time, including as a, fe a visiting fellow this past spring, which was really wonderful. Um, so I'm going to start talking. I'm going to I'm going to share my screen, um, and I have slides for much of the talk. So I'll, I'll just take step into that right now. Um, okay. 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 So uh, what I have on the screen here is a work by Alexander Berton, who is a Cuban artist living in Guantanamo City in Cuba. Uh, this is his, this is my very recent series, uh, Susuros en la Frontera, uh, and this, this piece he, he provisionally titled In Memoriam. And I think what you can see here, if you, to the extent you can decode this, it's a picture of a garita, a little, one of the watchtowers that dot the fence line between the naval base in Cuba and the base itself. Um, and it is, you know, it's on a pillar of the barbed wire that is so emblematic of the Guantanamo naval base, both in its separation from Cuba and in the detention centers for which it's become so well known. So it's really work like Alexander's that underpins my thinking about the Guantanamo base through the, ends, the lens of art, literature, and other forms of, of writing and, and culture produced on both sides of the fence line at the naval base. Um, before I sort of to say more about this, I just wanted to show a few more of the a few more images of the kinds of work that has made me really want to ask, ask the question, you know, how divided are they really? Um, what kinds of uh, relationships might we think of between the way writing and art is produced on both sides of this very fragmented, contentious border? Uh, so a couple of other things I will show are uh, some a previous uh, installation exhibit that Alexander Berton did with Pedro Juan Gutierrez in 2013 called El Camino de la Estrategia. This is the watchtower again, uh, this time made out of the fishing nets that had, were so important to the economy of this area of Cuba and that have been very much disrupted by activities at the base. Um, this is another from their uh, series. This is uh, Primera Trinchera de um, Primera trinchera de defensa contra el imperialismo, which is what the area is known as. Um, these letters are made out of salt, which is also uh, the one of the sort of primary economic drivers of this area. Um, and this is another piece from that 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 exhibit. This is a balance, a rocking chair that is sort of held stationary, holding screens on which people in the you know, near the who live near the naval base in Cuba have sort of told their stories. Um, other pieces that I'm working with, and I, I just want to put these out there because you know I will talk about the archive and the status of the archive, and I just want to say some some of the things that are in it. Uh, the Guantanamo poet Jose Ramon Sanchez, who has this expansive series of poems uh, about Guantanamo, both the base and the region of Guantanamo in which he lives. Um, there's also, there's, there are also a couple of other things uh, on the Cuban side, I would say particularly there's uh, some documentaries, some fiction uh, published by, very much by local institutions in Guantanamo province that really do talk about the base. Um, but I'm also really interested in what has been much more visible, which is the uh, growing corpus of memoirs, artwork and poetry by former detainees held at the detention centers at the base. Uh, memoirs, testimonies by former military personnel, many of whom have written about the sort of brutal experience that it is to be uh, guarding at Guantanamo. Uh, the sort of vast archival documentation, some of it authorized for release and some of it leaked about legal and sort of uh, uh, detention proceedings at Guantanamo. Um, and also written records of other populations at the base, um, among them, uh, uh, it, among them, the sort of military families who've lived there, who I'll talk about a little bit today. And I also want to say that I'm drawing uh, very, you know, very, very uh, respect, well, very respectingly um, and very indebtedly to the really crucial work of a lot of scholars who've worked on this topic, um, mainly in, in, from different areas, um, particularly Jenna Lipman, uh, Jonathan Hansen, who have written histories of the base in English, 
uh, Jose Sanchez Guerra, Julio Garcia, uh, Jorge Núñez in Cuba, and a lot of literary scholars too, who I won't name, uh, but I would like to say that Peter Hume um, is really one of the first people I know of to have linked literary writing from the base to Eastern Cuba as a potentially sort of, um, you know, as a potentially connected uh, archive. So the big picture proposal that I want to put on the table before I present a sort of more uh, formal together paper is the following. So number one, uh, that particularly since 2002, but also since the, you know, also since the early 1960s, the base has been represented and really defined by the hostilities of international relations, uh, by Cuba, US hostility, and the absolute incompatibility with the Cuban revolutionary project of a lease in perpetuity to the US, which is how the US has the base. Um, and on the other hand, the selection of the base as a holding place uh, for so-called enemy combatants in the also so-called war on terror. Um, these two, of course, are intimately connected, and a number of scholars have written about how, you know, how there's this clearly entrenched sort of neo-imperial reach to what to the holding of the base by the US and the holding of deten detainees there at the same time. So number two, and this is again part of the bigger picture, I want to, I want to think about how these, these sort of really crushing hostilities and the inviolable divisions they inscribed among different populations on the base, but also between the base and Cuba, have eclipsed a more subtle and potentially enduring sense of commonality that are impelled by the environmental continuity of the base with Cuba. Um, it's the same space environmentally. Um, and, take, and that are taken up, albeit somewhat tentatively, in writing and art at the base, and importantly, in areas of Cuba that border it. So finally, and this is where I'm, I'm, this is, I'm just coming to the end of a book on this, and I'm still sort of, I think, pushing out the sort of real conceptual framework for this archive that I've been working with. Um, I think what I, what, I, what I want to argue is this writing and art together produces a body of work with its basis in what I'm trying to think of as the sort of compassionate asymmetry, uh, which would be a form of comparison that contends with glaring differences of scale as well as a history of language and mobility. So I'm, I work in comparative literature um, and I'm trying to think of comparative literature as something that can compare uh, even when there is this sort of incredible sense of, of uh, asymmetry as I'll talk about more in the paper. Okay, so I'm gonna um, move to my paper, which is called Guantanamo Cuba and the Arts. So Guantanamo Cuba, a place whose legal contortions and human rights abuses continue to preoccupy advocates, activists, and scholars as 39, 39 men still face old age at American prisons there. A place, moreover, where Cubans have long decried the illegal occupation of the Guantanamo Naval Base, even as the area and the base harbor their own local history of migration. I think it's one of the lesser known migration routes from, from Cuba. Um, largely defined in the public eye by the hostilities and injustices that have underpinned both Cuba-US relations and the war on terror and Cuba's anti-imperialist rhetoric. Um, Cuba is nevertheless, a, uh, Guantanamo, sorry, is nevertheless a place of solidarities and sympathies that find in literature and art representations that are unavailable through legal and political processes. Since early 2002, in fact, a year from, the gen gen from next January, the basis, uh, sorry, a year, 20 years from next January, the basis 45 square miles have been inhabited by populations of vastly different experiences, housed in close proximity to one another. Detainees originally from over 40 countries, US military personnel working either for either Joint Task Force Guantanamo, which was set up to oversee detention operations, or for the much longer established US Navy, which is a presence on the base for a very long time. Uh, contract workers lodged lot, often from the Caribbean and the Philippines, and in the shorter term, lawyers and journalists from across the globe. Cubans also reside at the base as workers who chose to stay after diplomatic relations with the US ended. And many more Cubans, and this is the, the piece I'm really interested in, many more Cubans live with the base as they inhabit a broader Guantanamo, 
particularly that of the border towns of Caimanera and Boqueron, which are right up against the, the fence line of the base. Uh, once economically connected to the base, but now restricted zones secured by the Cuban military. For the writing and art, from the writing and art produced by and in the name of these very distinct inhabitants, there coheres, I think, a Guantanamo that is a literary and artistic region, one that crucially spans the fence line separating the base from Cuba. So to read recent work from the base alongside writing and art that locate themselves in its Cuban borderlands is to confront archives of asymmetry. Creative writing by detainees or by former detainees has been published in a number of languages, although not often in Spanish. Its literary references, particularly in, poet, in poetry, are often to Arabic traditions. Its imagined readers are rarely in Cuba. Its historical reference are distant. Comparative scholarship doesn't by any means run from such impediments, uh, even including among them the, the, the rigidity of what Peter Hume has called the enclave-like separation of the base from Cuba. The more challenging asymmetry really, and it's the one that I'm really sort of grappling with as I try to locate this project within Cuban studies, uh, is that of scope, size, and visibility uh, in this comparative archive. So despite the chaotic and extrajudiciary nature of its founding, the purportedly clandestine imperative of its operations and the no doubt remaining unknown surrounding these, Joint Task Force Guantanamo uh, has at various points in its existence been pretty solicitous in its claims to transparency. Um, and a number of scholars, including Rebecca Adelman, have written about this. It's published photographs, it's offered press tours, it's maintained its own relatively robust internet presence. This has been abundantly supplemented by the thousands of pages of military and legal documentation, some unclassified, uh, and so even more, much more released as part of unauthorized WikiLeaks document dumps. That is now publicly accessible, as well as testimonies, lists, and summaries collated on such really important advocacy sites as Witness to Guantanamo, Guantanamo Docket, the Guantanamo Public Memory Project, etc. Within contemporary Cuban art and literature, on the other hand, the base has to date left a faint footprint. On the one hand, and to perhaps state the obvious, the exposures, leaks, and efforts of transparency for the detention centers that have saturated the internet are less present in Cuba and haven't been a particular focus of either the state or the independent press. And Jenna Lippman has written about this, about, you know, with a number of thinking about why Guantanamo has such little presence in, in, um, in Granma, with the exception of a really very long article uh, that Fidel Castro wrote in, in, in 2008 um, about the history of the base, but also about the uh, reciprocal, the different humiliations that it has been used to, uh, to, to ensure. Um, I think another, another, in another sense, or another reason even, Guantanamo is a long way from the Havana that is still a hub of the hub of cultural production in Cuba. But even in the relatively defined literary context that is the province of Guantanamo, uh, with its literary production and artistic output maintained assiduously by state institutions and journals, the naval base really doesn't loom very large. Um, so I think what I'm looking at here is kind of as is asymmetries uh, that are in some ways like the minor narratives of cross-cultural solidarity that Lila Gandhi has written about, in other ways what Lisa Lowe has called unevenly legible intimacies, um, and then that, that, that are representative of the kinds of alliances, alignments uh, that constitute one's time as a space. So, to think through some of these asymmetrical alignments, I'm going to draw on three modes of engagement, uh, none of which might, one might initially associate with Guantanamo. So the words I'm going to choose to think about Guantanamo are grace, friendship, and empathy. And they emerge in written representations of three, three quite different experiences lived at and near the base. First, the experiences of detainees, of whom since 2002, there have been a total of roughly 780, with 39 remaining held, as we know, uh, well, mostly know, extrajudici extrajudicially in conditions universally condemned uh, from, from really from all sides. Second. 
second, Harvard, uh, U.S. Navy personnel and their families. I'm, I'm looking for the person that has this annealer. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, I'll just, I'll just start from this. Okay, so the three words that I'm thinking about, the three ideas to start with are grace, friendship, and empathy. And the three groups, uh, or the three kind of experiences that I think see of them as representing are those of detainees, uh, as of US Navy personnel and their families who live on the base and generally are not involved in detention operations in any way. And finally, the Cuban poet, Jose Ramon Sanchez, who has really been a persistent chronicler and questioner of what it means to be a long-term neighbor of the, of the base. So the first, the first idea is grace. And I'm gonna to move to a slide here. I think I can't, sorry, I'm just trying to get my slides back. Um, okay. So the warm Cuban sun hit me gracefully. It was a good feeling. This is how Mohamed al Slahi, former detainee at Guantanamo, recalls his arrival at the Guantanamo base. After the 30 hours shackled and blindfolded in a cold plane that would to precede his 14 years of detention and torture. The paragraph itself visually allows the Cuban sun to break through the bars of redaction. This is what much of, uh, Guantanamo, uh, of uh, Guantanamo Diary looks like in its first edition, hugely redacted um, as it was written during Slahi's detention and so brought out with, you know, with, with much restriction. But this move, I think that the move of a Cuba that comes forth to locate de detainees in a geography other than that of the US network of black sites, and that in doing so offers small gestures of comfort it's one that detainee memoirs reiterate as they recount what are essentially practices of survival. So for detainees at Guantanamo, uh, to recognize Cuba at all is initially a significant act of self-location on their part, amid the practices of geographic disorientation instituted when they were first transported to Guantanamo. Karen Greenberg, for example, has noted that newly, deta newly arrived detainees were blindfolded for their first 40 hours at the detention centers and were not told where they were for some time, as total disorientation was considered an aid to interrogation. And quoting from Greenberg, the security of the base might be compromised if prisoners could somehow locate themselves and thus have knowledge of the terrain. Similarly, a chapter based on interviews with Brendan Neely who was a former guard at the base, um, Jessica Sherrick writes, the detainees weren't allowed to know which country they were being held in. Brandon and the others would mess with them, telling them a different location every time they asked. They'd say, you're in Russia, you're in Iran, for example. So while Slahi is struck by the generosity of Cuba's son, it is often Cuban animals, the manifestation of Cuba's ecological continuity with the base, who provide detainees with clues as to their whereabouts. And as Peter Hume has suggested, offer models for freedom that can both sustain detainees' hopes and propel their despair. Former detainee Murat Kurnaz, for example, traces his slow realization that he is in Cuba uh, to the, the creatures he sees and hears in around his cell. So at one point, Kurnaz writes, iguanas, where are we? Uh, then, he writes, he, then he writes, hummingbirds, aren't they native to the Caribbean? And it's sort of by piecing this together that he realizes he's in Cuba and confirms it with a guard. Uh, Hume, in his chapter of Cuba's Wild East, um, traces ways in which the Cuban natural world infiltrates even, its most, even the base's most heavily protected spaces. Reading Kurnaz's memoir, along with that of British former detainee Mozambique, he notes that palm trees are visible from certain areas of the camps, as they are more, gen more generally elsewhere on the base. And the insects, birds, and the ubiquitous jutia, or translated as the banana rat, cross the border freely. So the natural creatures of Oriente, in, Hume, in Hume's words, sidle through the fence that is supposed to isolate the base from Cuba, and through the walls and cages that are supposed to isolate the prisoners from the outside world. 
two do two detainee memoirs published after Hume's book, one being Ahmed Arachidi's The General and the other Mansur Adaifi's Don't Forget Us Here, describe engaging with these border crossing or politically oblivious Cuban animals in ways that model reciprocal grace. Erechidi, a Moroccan citizen who had been working as a chef in London before his apprehension in Pakistan and detention in Guantanamo from 2002 to 2007, includes in his memoir a surprising recollection that when he was in an isolation cell, I'm quoting, visitors, visitors would come in their dozens three times a day after every meal. I would sit with them and enjoy their company. Visits to detainees, as one would expect, are heavily restricted and would have been likely to would be have been unlikely to include anyone outside the US military, aside from the authorized but rare meetings with defense lawyers and members of the International Red Cross. The dozens of visitors whom Irachidi receives, however, are in fact hordes of ants whose um, discipline and collaboration he learns from as he becomes a leader among detainees and for whom he orchestrates elaborate rescues so that they, if not he himself, can escape the cell. So there's, there's a whole passage about how he learns from the ants, he helps the ants, and I think there's something here about engaging with this sort of presence of human animal life to uh, think about how to, how to, how to enact grace. Uh, Adaifi, on the other hand, whose memoir is much more recent, receives an iguana as offering a connection between inside or out or confinement and freedom. And, and at the same time as allowing him to allowing him to reciprocate with hospitality and grace. This iguana, whom he nicknames Princess, pierced my heart with her kind eyes. A daifi feeds her from his rations, knowing that as a tribesman, I had learned it was an honor to be generous to your guests. He's Yemeni, and he it, part of his book writes about growing up as a, as a tribesman in Yemen. Um, he tells her stories of his home in Yemen, and she listened quietly, her presence giving me comfort. That there is both injustice and irony in the Cuban animal's freedom is not lost on detainees. Adaifi notes that soldiers could get fined a thousand dollars for harming iguanas as a protected species, and that they thereby had more considerably more rights than he did. This is something Terry Tomsky has worked on this question of rights, um, animal rights at one animal. And Peter Hume quotes an interrogation transcript in which a detainee is taunted by the love and care he sees among a family of Houthias. And he's told me, you'll never be with your family, but they are. Nevertheless, in many cases, detainee memoirs choose to dwell on the ways in which Cuba, as natural environment and animal life, both offers and inspires grace. In fact, the acknowledgement of Adaifi's memoir, the very last paragraph in his, in his acknowledgments, is thanking the animals of Cuba. Um, for sustaining him while he was while he was detained. Okay, um, so the second word I want to think about in relation to this sort of space is friendship. Okay, goodwill, neighborliness, and hospitality exude from the pages of the second example I want to give, which is the Guantanamo Bay Gazette, the Department of Defense publication for members of the military services and their families who are stationed at U.S. Naval Station Guantanamo Bay. Uh, this has been digitized recently by the University of Florida, which is um, it's just an amazing resource to, to have, and I, I'm very grateful to Holly Ackerman for um, enabling that. So it's a very local publication. The Gazette, the Guantanamo Bay Gazette, shares much of the general animus of community newspapers more generally, with regular sections shaping the sense of regularity and belonging that Benedict Anderson has noted in The Imagining of Community. Among these, um, among these sections are the, a, regular classified, uh, a regular classified section, uh, worship schedules and birth announcements, news, lunch menus from the Naval Station School, and a reliable annual calendar of holidays and events. There's an Easter egg, egg hunt, a July the 4th fireworks, the Halloween parade, Veterans Day, Thanksgiving, Christmas lights, you know, the, the calendar, the American calendar. Um, the newspaper is explicitly invested in amplifying the naval station's small town America image that I know that Jonathan Hansen's written about quite a lot. An editor, for example, writes of, writes of her experience living there that I love the fact that many of the residents know my name. I love being able to say hello to most of the people I pass on the street. I love having a name and a phone number already in my head when I need information. 
even as after 2002, the small community faces a rapid quadrupling of its military population from 2,500 in 2001 to 10,000 in 2005 because of the arrival of JTF Guantanamo and the opening of the detention centers. Um, the publication is really stalwart in its celebration of Guantanamo as a small enclosed community home, for example. It celebrates, um, uh, I can't, change my slides here, I'm sorry to try again. Um, let's keep moving. So it celebrates, uh, this, is, this is a ferry that was, a ferry that goes across the Guantanamo Bay that was uh, repaired. So as it comes home, everybody's sort of celebrating home sweet homes. This is Guantanamo as home sweet home. Indeed, and in, in some ways very kind of surprisingly or strangely, security priorities on the base are very, very domestic, uh, despite the fact that you know, this, is a, this place is known for uh, detention operations. Um, for example, security priorities remain a matter of how best to shelter from hurricanes, traffic safety, and even deterring occasionally aggressive local wild, wildlife. For example, a biting iguana finally captured. This is, this is, how, this is, this is danger in this, in this community. So while the Guantanamo Bay Gazette emphasizes neighborliness, mutual support, and friendliness among military, re military residents of the naval station, the word friendship has a particular connotation in its pages, one that acknowledges, even as it conscripts, a Cuban presence on and not just across the fence line from the base, as well as a permeability, permeability between the two spaces that belies the base's isolation. Every year, a late January issue of the Gazette includes a front page report on Cuban American Friendship Day. Celebrations of Cuban American Friendship Day include a run along the fence line that separates the base from Cuba, uh, the space here, music and dance performances by the Latinx community on the base, occasional appearances by Cuban members of the US military, such as former Navy General Counsel Alberto Mora, who's Cuban, uh, it's it really interestingly, some ser servicemen who, there are a, a few articles on servicemen who had been on the base as children as Balseros in 1994 and had subsequently enlisted in the US Navy and were coming back to the base uh, in an entirely different context. Um, even Congresswoman Ileana Rosletinen, who was, was once at uh, uh, Cuban American Friendship Day in January 2002, when given happenings on the base more broadly, there was a con uh, congressional delegation. I think just as the detention centers opened, there was simultaneously this Cuban American uh, Friendship Day celebration. But the most celebrated guests at Cuban French American Friendship Day are the Naval Station's Cuban workforce. Indeed, these are a mainstay of what the Gazette describes as, I'm quoting, a community of Cuban and American friends working together to make Gitmos and GTMO the truly unique family that it is. Until 2012, the Cuban workforce fell into two categories. The commuter workers who, as Jana Lipman has documented, were among those permitted in 1964 to commute daily between the base and Cuba their numbers dwindling until the retirement to Cuba of the final two in, 20, in 2012, and the special category residents, workers initially numbering over 400, who chose to remain on the base to work in the 1960s and have stayed there until retirement, their numbers having now declined to just 19. It's interesting that their, their obituaries honoring lives often lived over multiple borders, a real sort of frequent inclusions in the Guantanamo Bay Gazette. And they're really the on, only obituaries because the, the naval station population is young and transient. Um, it's the special category residents as well as the detainees who are getting old and are really the, the reason for sort of improved geriatric medical services on the naval base. So friendship um, with commuter workers, with the commuter workers as celebrated on the designated day had ceremonial trappings. So when the commuter wor workers arrived, would arrive on Cuban American Friendship Day, they would be greeted by a welcome party as they arrived at the base's north gate. Uh, they be presented with awards, or awards for long service, etc. Friendship with special category residents. Now this is a photo of the Mont uh, 
can't get my sorry my sorry my powerpoint keeps uh freezing here i'm not sure why friendship with special uh, category residents and this is a picture of them in 2007 um given their continuous presence on the base you know they have lived there longer than any member of the u.s navy um, and have by and large stayed in place it's constructed in a different way in a first, in the first place the circumstances of their being there allow for an overtly political alliance that the commuter workers often suspect border crossing precluded. These Cubans, the special category residents, are, and I'm quoting, Cubans who sought refuge on the base from the Marxist government of Fidel Castro, a stance that many of, this, of these residents interviewed over the decades more or less reaffirm. Um, it is an alliance that becomes, however, more complicated in its cultural and affective dimensions. Um, while the Gazette, while, while in the Gazette, the uh, primarily residential area and community area of the nasal station is re represented, as I said, as a sort of small town America, the neighborhood where the Cuban residents live, known as called Santa Bargo, Santa Bargo or Bargo, is in the words of a, few, a former Cuban community assistant, assistance program manager, a small quintessentially Cuban village aboard the naval station. So we have you know, this sort of small town America, which at the same time accommodates a small quintessentially Cuban village, or of course on the island of Cuba. Um, introducing readers to this community that for, for the editors of the Gazette is both exotic and far more at home than anyone else on the naval station can be. The, art, the article continue, um, extols the delights of what it says it calls the authentic Cuban cuisine, the Caribbean music, and the traditions and culture they brought with them, including long games of dominoes they play in, the, in their specially constructed Cuban community center. The special, special category Cuban residents interviewed in, in, in the Gazette over the decades attest to a life both ruptured by exile and at the same time deeply connected to the Cuba whose lights are visible from the base at night, whose radio programs they listen to, just as residents of some areas of Guantanamo province have picked up radio and TV and cell phone signals from the base, and a Cuba where they still have many close family ties, broken painfully when the last commuters, human conduits of their messages and photos retired to Cuba. And I, I think there's some, you know, in, in the bigger project, I think more about how this, this particular exile group is and isn't like other Cuban exiles you know, elsewhere, particularly in South Florida. And what one, you know, one, one main thing being they're sort of, <laughs> they're actually in Cuba. Um, okay. So, this particular Cuban friendship, I think, um, is quite consistent with community, even family me me metaphors in which the, the Guantanamo Bay Gazette is invested. Seemingly directed unilaterally at the station's Cuban commuters and residents, it becomes fraught when facing the non-ceremonial, especially with regard to what kind of friendship this, in fact, can be. I mean, what I, what I, my point here is that it's really a friendship directed at this, this community. There's not much sense of whether friendship is, you know, the effective gesture that comes from them too. Um, so I think this instability, this the inadequacy of the idea of friendship here, in fact, gestures at precisely the kinds of relational asymmetry that I that I want to think about as as shaping Guantanamo. So the final and the perhaps the more predictable of these relations that I want to put on the table is empathy, which I'll address through the poetry of Jose Ramon Sanchez. So Sanchez is one of a few Cuban writers whose work addresses the presence in his country of both the naval base and the detention camps. While outrage at the presence of the base is increasingly vocal among many, many um, artists, writers, and political figures in Cuba, um, talking about the detention camp is, is, is less so. So Sanchez's collection Taliban, which was published in, in 2018, includes some poems initially published in La Noria, the, the small and um, semi-independent literary journal that Sanchez and Oxtar Truce edited in, in the city of, Guanta of Santiago de Cuba, as well as other poems from his still uh, not fully published Gitmo project. The poems reflect on the history and continued presence of the base in Guantanamo province through actual, borrowed, and imagined knowledge of it. 
and Sanchez talks about this. Um, the archive of knowledge from which Sanchez draws is vast, buried, and haphazard. He draws from his own memories of a childhood in which light, sound, and broadcast signals from the base reached into the surrounding areas of Cuba, creating illusions of conviviality and worldliness particular to this region of Cuba. One, in, one, one moment that one of his poems talks about is when El Duque Hernandez won the World Series for the Yankees, and he says people in Guantanamo knew this before anyone else, anywhere else in Cuba. Um, he also refers to printed history and maps, both obscure and mainstream, official records pertaining to the base's creation and development, um, oral reports from, from residents of Guantanamo province, some of whom were former workers at the base, and copious, if sporadic and disrupted internet research. Incorporated into this sort of references of, of Sanchez's poetry are texts from the literary and political histories of the detainees. Um, in the forms and languages in which Sanchez has encountered these. Um, he draws particularly from this Spanish translation of, um, Jose, of, of Mark, Mark Falkoff's poems from Guantanamo, which was interestingly translated into English before it was translated into any other language. Um, so Sanchez's poems look to the fence line between Cuba and the base as a source of temptation and frustration and as an agent of isolation that the imagination can nevertheless to some extent overcome. The border is visible from where he's writing in Cuba as a system of wire fencing punctuated by surveillance tower and surrounded by a minefield. Uh, it's been closed by, since the 1960s with passage across it in either direction, restricted to Cuban commuters and more recently to high level meetings between military representatives from both countries. As a result, despite glimpsing the lights and structures of the base, Sanchez, the poet in, in this collection, can see and know little about life there. For a poet to write about the base as he writes, as Sanchez writes in his poem Imposible, is to submit to the authority of others uh, when forming one's own knowledge and experience. The paltry assortment of materials and memories that are available to him must be supplemented by what others have reported. He writes, Imágenes que otros vieron por mí, are the sort of uh, what, he, what, he's, what he needs us to write about. What emerges from Sanchez's writing is an ambitious attempt to imagine the border from both sides, from Guantanamo, Cuba, and the poet's experience there, and from the physical space of the base and the lives of detainees at the camps. It seeks to acknowledge common ground in the sharing of both a small area of land and an experience of isolation dictated by geographical and political circumstance. This imagining at times manifests as an articulation of proximity as comparison, but at other times as a farther reaching occupation of the place of detainees by the poetic voice. And this is where I'm thinking about sort of empathy and asymmetry, this sort of move to try to be in the place of uh, a detainee, even as there's so many sort of asymmetries in those experiences. So the poem Los Kilos, published as one of eight poems by Sanchez in a 2014 issue of La Noria, dedicated to the Guantanamo naval base, insists on comparison as an inevitable practice for a poet writing about the base. Its second stanza states this emphatically, Imposible escribir la base si no te comparas con sus víctimas. These lines establish a, work, a working principle for the Gitmo collection, that one can only write about the base by comparing oneself to its victims, at the same time as they chart a broadly common ground for Guantanamo, opening the de denomination of victim beyond the detainees currently at the base's wow. camp. The poem offers an image of US Marines on leave in towns around the base before the Cuban Revolution, throwing small change to impoverished Cuban children victims of the base's economic impact on the region, both before and after the revolution. The base's victims, the poem implies, are not only its current detainees, but also those Cubans who have lived in its vicinity outside its limits for over a century, subject to the designs of empire, infiltrated Cuban soil surreptitiously, as what the, the same poem calls, oh, oh no, another poem in the collection, sorry, calls Un Caballo de Troya in el Caribe. The particularly spatial quality of being in another's place drives one of the more linguistically challenging poems of Sanchez's collection, La Flecha Negra. And I'm gonna put this on the screen if I can, even though I know it's in kind of small print. Um, and I'm, I'm mostly gonna focus on the second stanza. Um, 
It's written in the third person and it opens with a scene in the cells of those the poem names as Los Presos Musulmanes. The precision with which the um, detainees location and the Mecca to which they pray are charted in La Flecha Negra in numerical coordinates, implying a calculated effort on the poet's part to know and recount their situation. So this is a poem in which um, it's imagining the scene in which um, in which detainees in the cell, the cell blocks at Guantanamo are praying, um, which is the scene that comes up a lot in their memoirs and was facilitated when, it, when at one point the US military uh, allowed uh, black arrows to be painted on the floors of cells pointing towards Mecca. So the second stanza, as you can see, is composed largely of coordinates. La base está en los 19.54, etc. I'm not going to. Uh, I find it hard to pronounce. I think this is the problem, um, rendering it visually strange and unwieldy to pronounce. In recognition of the many levels of defamiliarization to which detainees are subject, and of the limits of verbal language in the context that is Guantanamo. As I was saying, the poem refers to the black arrows pointing to Mecca painted on the floors of Ukrainian cells and to the prayers that must, must travel 12,793 kilometers over the Atlantic, um, over the Sahara and over the Red Sea to reach their destination. The final lines of the poem, which I think you can just about see at the end of this screen, punctuated by a long ellipsis, ask, y si los americanos no hubieron puesto las flechas, Entonces, okay. I think. Um, so the poetic voice remains at a distance grammatically, but its detailed recounting of the detainee's precise location and its imagining of the pain of literal disorientation, of not being allowed to know which way it's east, imply, I think, an effort to engage intensely with their experience. So I'm, I'm going to end in a second with this. This is the sort of the last example. So Sanchez's poems rehearse different ways of being like, being with, and simply being a detainee at Guantanamo. The latter position being one that seems to overrule qualitative distinctions between the suffering of subjects who inhabit the, the Guantanamo region differently in favor of what presents as empathic approximations. Empathy, as decades of scholarship has shown, does not fully account for the differences in relationships and for the constitutive unknowability of another's experience, which is all the more pronounced in this context. It is then another imperfect, inadequate asymmetry. And as I read it, another example of the sort of fractured commonalities and asymmetries that mark this Guantanamo as an area. So in closing, which I, I think is not a full conclusion, but in closing, I'd say that these asymmetries that I want to trace take shape in a, in a borderland that is, is really as closed as any other. I think Peter Hume's um, phrase the perfect enclave, enclave is, is really helpful. There are symmetries that are grounded in difference of language, history, political context, medium, even of form. And, and they're grounded in hostilities that have overshadowed the actual uncontainable continuity that it, uh, the environment presents as I think much of this sort of recording of animal presence um, implies. Nevertheless, there are symmetries that manifest as small gestures of curiosity, kindness, goodwill, of grace, friendship, empathy that are woven into the poetry, narrative, and art of, of, this, of this space that I, I, as I said, I want to think of as, as a region, um, a literary sort of artistic region. So thank you. That's, um, that's a sort of overview of the project and the paper, and I'd be very happy to hear from anyone um, on any, any, of these, any of these pieces. Thank you so much, Esther, for that truly fascinating presentation. I mean, rarely do we put Guantanamo and words like empathy and friendship in the same <laughs> sentence. <laughs> so um, this is a very uh, interesting and provocative uh, work that you are doing. Folks, since this is, we, we always try when possible to do this as a Zoom meeting so that we can have a conversation. So. I see that Carlos Rodriguez has raised his hand and I'm going to give him the floor. Carlos. Uh, thank you, Alejandro. Uh, and thank you, Esther, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, one anecdote that I would love to share with you because <laughs> I don't know if you know it or not, but uh, 
uh, an individual by the name of Carlos uh, 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 who is now Secretary of the Navy, Carlos del Toro. Carlos mm -hmm. del Toro uh, was the first Cuban American to command a, a a, a, a Aegis class destroyer, brand new destroyer, yeah. and it was given to his command. Right after the vessel was quote unquote baptized, its first mm -hmm. trip was to Guantanamo Bay. So mm -hmm. Carlos del Toro became the first Cuban American to visit Guantanamo, commanding a Navy ship. Mm -hmm. He was honored in that visit and I had the pleasure of having been invited by him to be there. He was honored as the person honored in that Cuban American day. Mm -hmm. And to make, uh, you know, in one of those ironies of life, the ship was named USS Bulkley. <laughs> admiral Bulkley was the last right. admiral yeah. at the base to have the water shut mm -hmm. off uh, on the base by Fidel Castro. Right. A small anecdote. I thought you would appreciate that. Yeah, when, when was this? Uh, oof, this must be roughly, I mean, at my age time, it seems like yesterday, but it was not. It's further, further back. It's probably 10 years ago. And it's, oh, oh, that's great. Thank you very much. And, and Carlos del Toro was just named uh, a yeah. Secretary of the Navy right, so right. by the Biden mm -hmm. administration. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. So again, if you want to ask a question, and uh, I, I, I was following the chat, but here we actually have the chance to talk to Esther. I don't, I don't want to be reading from the chat. I much rather hear from you, June. You're muted, Querida. You're muted. I always do that. Sorry. Um, I'm really curious about the newspaper yeah. and whether there was there any sense is there any censorship and how does that work mm -hmm. and how if at all did it cover the revelations of, of torture? Yep, that's it. That so the newspaper, June. I'm, I'm glad you asked that, um, and I know that you you have a lot to say about that. Um, the newspaper is totally fascinating. Um, it's very much, you know, so it was in, it, it's been in, in existence since way before, you know, since like, since way before the, the war on terror. Um, as far as I know, I mean, if you read it, you would think it was like a newspaper from your little town somewhere you know, somewhere really far away from anywhere. Um, so it, I don't know if it's censored. Um, you know, it, it is published on, I, mean, I, don't, I think censored may be too strong a word for it, you know, the way that a small community newspaper chooses what to report on. Um, you know, it is under the Department of Defense and it is being published or is being written for a population in a, you know, that is in a very, very sensitive area. So I'm sure there's things that they wouldn't publish. Um, but it's the tenor of it isn't there's there's just you know strikingly little about what about the Guantanamo that the world is looking at uh, from 2002. Um, there's a little bit there, and most of it is sort of in the language of welcome. So when these when all these new all these new military forces arrive. Um, they say, you know, and we're going to welcome them and we're going to make them feel at home. Um, and it's very much a reiteration of this, although there is there's something said that we won't extend the same welcome to the um, other people who are arriving here, obviously, uh, which is the detainees. Um, so there's not much. I mean, there's a little bit about um, security and what it might mean. You know, I think in the very early days of the detention centers, there was some sense that you know, the detainees might actually be in danger. Um, so there is a little bit about, you know, how to reflect questions about this, how to talk to your children about what it is to, to be here. Um, but really, it's, you, it's hard to square this as happening in the same place. And, and in a lot of ways, it isn't the same place, but it, but it sort of is, right? So, you know, the, so yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting newspaper. I mean, interesting in the way that a little kind of newspaper selling baby cribs is, <laughs> so, yeah. And who who are the reporters? They are Department of Defense reporters. It's a it's a um it's a category within the military, which is to sort of produce news for the military. Um, I, I can't remember what it is, but there's a certain you know there's a certain numerical category within the military. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Caddy, with your permission, I'm going to let Holly 
uh, jump in because I, I suspect that she has something to say or, uh, or to add about the newspaper, okay? And then I'll, I'll, I'll give you a floor. Yep. Holy. I'll, I'll try to be quick. Um, so the reason these newspapers got digitized is because I go on eBay and I look for primary documents about Cuba and I found this one edition from the 1940s called The Indian was the title of the newspaper. And it said the daily newspaper of Guantanamo Bay. Um, so I started trying to find what are the names of all the newspapers from the base. And I wound up having to go to the secretary of the Navy's office and they wound up saying, we don't know anything about these newspapers. If you want to know, you would have to contact the public affairs officer mm -hmm. at Guantanamo. And they gave me his phone number, a guy named Terrence Peck, who turned out to be a prince. Um, and he said, are there newspapers? There's an entire basement room full of them. And if you think I'm going to sort them out so you can know about them, you're wrong. <laughs> But if you would like for me to get you permission to come to the base and sort through these newspapers, I'd be glad to do it. So I got to go to Guantanamo and take this gigantic heap of paper and sort it all out. And then I got a grant to, um, to get it digitized, but we couldn't send it to Duke because for some reason, the Secretary of the Navy would only let it go to Florida. It couldn't go out, I could ship them, but I could only ship them to Florida. And so the people in Gainesville agreed to digitize them. But the way it began was a sailor is assigned to be the editor. They might not know anything about journalism. And because they're assigned to be in charge of the newspaper, they can decide what the name of the newspaper is. So there, over time, if you look at it from the 1940s when it started, the name of the newspaper changes many times. But then in the 2000s, I think the late 2000, the early 2000s or late 1990s, they got a bigger staff um, and they have kept the, the Guantanamo Gazette, they've kept the same name. But my interest was during the, when the rafters were there and when the Haitians were there. Mm -hmm. And it's a very, very interesting set of documents because they started a two or three or sometimes four page section during that time about the Haitian camps and about the Cuban camps. And the distinction between the talk about the Haitian camps and the talk about the Cuban camps is really startling. Thank you, Holly. By the way, Holly, I included in the chat uh, a link to the uh, Digital Library of the Caribbean where the newspaper can be uh, consulted. Kari. Oh, can I just respond to Holly and say thank you, Holly? I thank you so much. Um, I know for, for doing that work. I read about how you spent some time there, um, and it's just a fascinating publication. And I, as you say, if somebody hadn't gone and done that sort of work on the ground in the basement, um, there'd be no no way of reading this. And I, I think it's such an important piece of thinking about Guantanamo. So thank you. I actually, well, lo I actually love the eBay origin of this. Yes. <laughs> And, and one last thing, if it weren't for Terrence Peck, it yeah. would never happen. Every single public affairs officer since, I've contacted them with questions and things I want to do, yeah. and they don't even answer. He yeah. was um, uniquely hospitable. Wow, yeah. Patty. I was very interested in the books that you were talking about uh, that the, um, uh, at the beginning of the of the both the detainees, the former detainees, um, and I wondered if there was okay. I think there was a mix up, um, Patty. Yes. Okay. Um, we lost you. You were speaking and then you got muted and we lost you. Okay. Um, I wondered if there was a bibliography. I, th I think the question, Esther, is uh, whether there is uh, any place where, where she can access uh, the various authors and, uh, that, you, that you referenced during your talk. 
and you are muted, dear. Um, there, I don't know of any specific bibliographies about the detainee memoirs because they continue. You know, the one that I quoted just came out less than a month ago, so they're still, you know, they're, they're still sort of being accumulated. Um, Barbara Harlow, uh, who was a literary scholar, has a, an essay that's about ten years old now. The way she tries to, the way she sort of assembles what is the corpus of writing about Guantanamo. So she has some of the early ones. Um, there's jo Josephine Metcalf has an article about memoirs, which she published a couple of years ago, and she, I think she counts about 10. Um, there have been more since then, but Josephine Metcalf's article, uh, which I could, oh, I wish I could put it in the chat, but I can't remember the name of it. There, if you want it, I can certainly direct you to the most recent sort of list of, you know, bibliography of the memoirs at least, if you, if you want to write to me, yeah. Thank you, Esther. Garcia Yero. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thank you so much um, for such a, a uh, such such an interesting, amazing presentation. I am very curious. So I was in in Guantanamo in 2016, and I was only in passing. I was only there for the day, but I really, as you can imagine, wanted to to see the base as close as you know, get to the as yeah. close as possible, just as a matter of curiosity. As um, yeah. you know, it's such an intense <laughs> space, right? And, and I sort of like inquired and it seemed that I, I had to ask permission to access. So it seemed that it was very difficult, but not necessarily impossible. So I wanted to ask you what has been your own experience in trying to sort of like cross that, the, that border, right? I guess if you have um, gone to, like, what has been your, ex your physical experience, right? If you have gone to the base, how, how yeah. has it been? Uh, <laughs> and how that experience then has sort of like shaped yeah. The, you know, you work on your understanding of that space. Oh, thank you. That's such a good question because, you know, it really, I, I try, so, I mean, it's so important to me to try and visualize the base and yet it's so hard to <laughs> be, and that's, and that's part of the point, right? So I, I, um, I think Jorge Nunez is here and I am again, really grateful to Jorge Nunez, who's the president of the UNIAC in Guantanamo, who is, who got me also in 2016, uh, you know, who, you, you need a, you need a pass. Um, and uh, Jorge took me to Caimanera and showed me around, and I could very much see the base from there. So you know, the, the, you you, it's it's not somewhere you can walk into, uh, as you know. There's a sort of you know, there's military signs around Caimanera, etc. Um, so I haven't been to the naval base, and I I can tell you the story about this. So I was, um, it's it's kind of a long story. It involves people here as well. So. Um, I think in, in, in during, I think probably the, I'm not sure, during the Obama administration, um, it was a little easier. Um, during the at the very end, I'm, I'm, I'm getting my, my, my times wrong, but right before the first Trump election, I had, I was on a trip to go to visit the naval base. At that point, you needed to the, the main way I, I like Holly was getting no real um, answer from any of the press officers. So I was going to go on the jo jo journalist tour, which is a very scripted tour. Um, and I know from people who've been on it, it's a four day tour. You're given the list of questions that you can ask. You're not allowed to ask any other questions. Um, you know, you're taken on a tour of the detention center and you know, it wasn't really what I wanted to do at all, but I thought at least I would get to see the place. Um, so June Ehrlich, who is here, said I could be a journalist for their Easter, so I got the pass through that, um, and I had it all set, but then Trump got elected, and then I got a message saying, sorry, you're not on the list anymore, and you're not ever going to be on the list, um, so I don't know what, I don't know what that was all about, and I need to try again, um, but, you know, with the, with the, you know, with the pandemic, I, I doubt very much I'd be able to get there right now, so th those are my spatial stories, but I really appreciate the question, because it seems like such a question of space. Um, and it's, I've looked at so many different kinds of images and maps and things to try to figure out what the space means, um, but, you know, limited actual being in the space. So, yeah. Um, you can still be a journalist for a <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> if I write a story, I know. Yeah. I would have written a story. <laughs> Thank you. It's Karina. Karina Sende. Um, Thank you so much for this uh, inspiring discussion. And um, 
So I'm I'm a PhD candidate at BU and I uh, study African diasporic mobility. Mm -hmm. So I am in the capacity of general audience here, I would say, because mm -hmm. I know very little about the topic. And mm -hmm. so my question kind mm -hmm. of, um, um, you know, demonstrates my ignorance. Uh, if you could speak to the fact why, uh, you know, huge chunks of uh, the diaries were so heavily redacted mm -hmm. um, and what sort of classified information mm -hmm. there is. And then uh, based on that, who published the diaries? Because mm -hmm. I don't fully understand why they would need to be so heavily redacted. Okay. And what, what the, uh, you know, approximate time period is. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, there's a difference between um, redact. So, so writing that was produced actually while detainees were in detention on the base uh, has to pass through. I mean, it's super hard to get it out anyway. Um, and it has to pass through many, many layers of military scrutiny before it can be published. Um, so when detaining, what, so the, there's only one memoir that I know of that's been redacted and it's the, it's the, it was the first edition of Slahi's memoir because he wrote it while he was in detention. Um, and he wrote it, he learned English in detention. He wrote his diary in, in detention. Uh, he passed it to his lawyer. His lawyer tried to get it published and could only get it published with these huge chunks. So, you know, as many, there's a couple of people who've written about it, I said it looks more like a work of art in some places than it does like a book because it's just all these sort of blackouts. Um, when detainees have left, they can do what they want. So there are some of the major publishers, you know, in the UK and in the US have published detainee memoirs, but the ones that, are, that, are, that originate actually in Guantanamo are much more difficult to get out. Um, so Slahi's, you know, that, that was sort of the story with Slahi's. Um, there was an earlier volume, which was called Poetry from Guantanamo, which was published in 2007. Um, and this one, you know, I think went through layers of censorship that were both about sort of military rules and about kind of linguistic challenges. So they were written in, most of them were written originally in Arabic and Pashto. Um, but the only people allowed to translate them were military classified translators. Um, so if you're a literary translator, you know that you you don't do the same thing as a military translator. <laughs> um, but nevertheless, they were translated by 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 class. They were, they were not members of the military, but they needed a level of classification that you you don't normally have as a translator. As translator, um, they, the poetry was censored for all kinds of reasons. And one of the anecdotes is that. Um, you know, some you know, people had written things that went, I won't go into this anecdote, but people have written things that seem, I think one of the questions was the sort of suspicion and decoding of anything written in the, in the detention centers was just really, you know, a, a, an opportunity for censorship. And I think one of the most interesting recent, um, you know, recent examples of this is there was a, an art exhibit in New York. I wanted to say it was 2017. I might have the date wrong. It was when there was a, this like enormous snowstorm in New York, but it was an art exhibit of art painted by detainees during their art classes in the detention camps, which they now have. Um, they'd given art to their lawyers, which their lawyers were exhibiting um, in um, uh, John Jay College in New York. And there was a, there was a big kind of, um, Scandal, or, scandal's not the right word, but anyway, there was a decision that these works of art could not be sold because if they were sold, they would be benefiting detainees in Guantanamo. And then subsequently, there was a ban on taking art out of Guantanamo. Um, so there's, there's a lot, uh, and, but uh, you know, it affects people who are still there less than it affects people who are not. Thank you. Uh, Esther, Diane? Thank you, Esther. I just had a quick question yeah. about if you know whether the, the guards at the prison, yeah. did they have families living on the base? Were they going back and forth? <laughs> what was that like? No, no, they didn't. So there's, you know, there's these two separate populations, really. There's the, the naval community that, you know, that Holly was involved with that has been, you know, there for a long time and has, you know, has newspapers and schools and baseball fields and cinemas and things. But then the people who end up working at, at the detention centers mostly come from the uh, military police units of the US Army. Um, and they mostly serve nine month tours, although they often get, you know, extended. 
and no, they 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 don't have their families on the base. Um, you know, they live yeah, they they live quite solitary, like very difficult lives. And I think you know one of the um, ironies that comes out in a lot of the writing about this is you know they there's been serious kind of um, PTSD on the part of guards um, who have been in the detention centres. Not to mention the kind of PTSD that the former detainees have. So it's just this, you know, it's just this sort of context of terror in and of itself. But the short answer is no. <laughs> I don't know the family there. Yeah. Uh, Terry. Hello. I would give you a very short but very different perspective on Guantanamo Bay. Please. I was there. I was yeah. there for, for a month. Yeah. Uh, first in 1968 and then mm -hmm. in 1970, mm -hmm. each for two weeks. Uh, but never sleeping there, sleeping on a gray aircraft carrier instead. Mm -hmm. We were doing what was called our shakedown cruises, where we practiced all sorts of activities based on like Guantanamo. The one quick story is the guard gate and the fence was, was located very close to the approach mm -hmm. end of the runway. So we had to make a rather courageous mm -hmm. short turn to land every time. And the warning was, if you don't, you will get shot. And with that, I will... Uh, <laughs> My art memory is uh, 20 wonderful <clears throat> monkey pod plates that we still use. In fact, we used them again last <laughs> night. With last Thanks for the wonderful show. It's a very interesting perspective. Oh, thank you for that. No, I think, yeah, I, thank you. No, there's a lot in the sort of Cuban stories as well about how, how, what a sort of Cold War context it was, you know, in the 60s. And Jane, Jane has spoken about that. So, thank you. Okay. Esther, can I, let me jump in and ask uh, a question since I don't see a, another hand. Um, you've given us a view of, uh, of Guantanamo, which is, um, you know, it's, it's very much from within Guantanamo, from within the base and from the surrounding area. I mean, uh, um, Alexander Beatone is, a, is, a, is, a, is an artist who was born in Guantanamo, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I want you, uh, I want to ask you to zoom out and, and then place Guantanamo. Um, if, if we are thinking about Cuban studies and about where Guantanamo, mm -hmm. you made a very interesting observation, which is that Guantanamo doesn't show up that frequently in Cuban media. And it's, mm -hmm. it's not in grandma every day. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if this has something to do if whether there is uh, within Cuba well, the Guantanamo registers also as a, as a land of desire, right? As a, as a place of, um, you know, the, the way it registers, the way it appears, for instance, in Reinaldo Arenas uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. before mm -hmm. Night Falls, mm -hmm. which Guantanamo is, 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 is a place, you know, uh, which is associated with freedom, it's associated with escape, it's associated with, you know, has other associations. Mm -hmm. um, so even though Guantanamo has now become very much associated with the presence of these uh, of these detainees in this legal limbo, uh, horrifying legal limbo. Uh, within Cuba, the, that that other narrative may still uh, may still be powerful enough that it's better to keep Guantanamo off the of the center. So I just wanted to hear your thoughts on this. No, thank you for that question. Um, it's something I've been sort of really grappling with, and it's you know in some ways it's a uh, it 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 feels like a speculative kind of research because I really don't know <laughs> um, why but I think a lot of things that have you know that have come up as I've been working on this are um, you know it's kind of a taboo or it has been it was a taboo for a lot of reasons um, one of these is you know as I as I said you know it, it as you sort of say it, it's a migration route um, and it's a different migration route from the ones that people know about um, and it's a super dangerous one um, but it's one that has persisted over the decades. So, you know, I, I hadn't thought about that in the question in terms of desire, but the fact that there are, you know, there are a few narratives, like pieces of fiction that are about this sort of attempt to leave Cuba by, one, by the naval base. Um, and they've been published, and they've been published in, you know, in journals in Guantanamo, um, but, you know, or in, in presses in Guantanamo, but I think in general, it's probably, you know, it's a, it's a, it has, it does have some history as a kind of a tough topic. Um, there's also, you know, there, there are other people who sort of thought about this. So Dara Goldman's book from um, Islands and Identities, and I can't, I can't remember the title, but Dara Goldman's book from 2008 says, you know, thinks about this in terms of shame, of like national shame. Uh, you know, the, the, the usurpation of Guantanamo is like historically a, a sense of a, a place of shame. 
um, and there's, you know, it's not something to be putting out there. Um, I think there's also such an incredibly strongly ingrained rhetoric. I mean, I say there's not much of Guantanamo in cultural production, but, you know, Fidel Castro talked about Guantanamo a lot. Um, and, you know, but there was sort of one way of talking about it. Um, and there's not really a lot of leeway in terms of talking about it any than, anything other than what he called it, which was un puñal clavado en el costal de la patria. Um, so, you know, that, that's, the, that's the line on it. And so to diverge from that is a little harder. Um, and, you know, Jane, Jane Only Lippmann has an article, it's not in her book, she has an article about Grandma and Guantanamo. And you know, she, I think one of the things that she brings up there is this sort of fraught um, definition of what human rights is in Cuba. Um, and that, you know, to be decrying human rights abuses at the base is to get into the kind of tough territory. <laughs> um, and, you know, what her reading of grandma is that grandma redefines human rights as the embargo. Um, and so, you know, there's a sort of, you know, co-opting of what, what, what that idea is. So lots of reasons, <laughs> I don't know, yeah. And well, I do think the fact it's just like really far away in the way that Guantanamo province is kind of conceived of from the metropolis is not, you know, is not, the province itself is not as a particular place of interest, I think. Sure. You know, when I see, when, I, when you show the, the baton, the, the first image, um, yeah. first when I see, when I see things like this in the, in the visual arts, I always assume that it's because they're probably difficult to speak about in other yeah. spaces and the arts is the space where, right. yeah. where mm -hmm. you can put some of these, uh, of these topics on the table. But you know, the barbed wire, the barbed wire surrounding the tower can be read uh, both as a, as, a, as, a, you know, as a way to keep something within but yeah. it's also a barrier um, to keep uh, those without, you know, those who are outside. So the, the barbed wire can mm -hmm. can work in in different uh, in different uh, ways. Can can I ask you? I think it, uh, the audience it would be interesting. I, I, I was asking Esther this before <laughs> or before the talk began today yeah. because this project is really not a natural segue from her previous yeah. scholarship. This is, or perhaps it is. Um, I couldn't quite find the thread very clearly but uh, mm -hmm. I wonder how how you got to yeah uh, how you how you landed in Guantanamo. <laughs> well as you know I got there starting writing about whales <laughs> which is you know which is oh, it's just a real kind of uh, you know off the beaten track thing no I think partly it's you know a number of things so I you know I, I my 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 uh, other book about about specifically about Cuba in the special period I was I wrote as uh you know as a I began as a graduate student in Spanish at, at Harvard, um, but I, I was hired by a comparative literature department. Um, so I, you know, I, I've been sort of slowly sort of thinking about, well, what, what is, what is, you know, how do I think about comparison? Um, so that's one thing. I mean, I think this is a, this is a context that is like, you know, it's Caribbean, it's Middle Eastern, it's European, it's, it's, it's a sort of real, I mean, I think it almost inflates the kind of, you know, Benitez Rojo, like, uh, heterogeneity of the Caribbean, like, 10 times over, because there's so much sort of difference there. So that's one piece. Um, and I think the other one is, you know, that, and I, this was, and I, this, I know this is sort of what um, has been the starting question for other people who've written about Guantanamo, like Janet Littman, is, you know, when the war on terror started, there was this sort of dissociation of Guantanamo from Cuba. Um, and it, you know, it was initially, this, initially the Cuban government supported the US in taking detainees to Guantanamo. And then they, when they realized what was really happening, they sort of got less supportive. But I, there was always this question for me and people would even ask me like, you know, isn't Guantanamo in Cuba? And I'm like, yeah. Um, and so, you know, so I, this question of what did it mean? So it didn't seem like such a different, such a diversion for me. I feel like I'm still doing Cuban studies. Um, I've had a bit of a hard time at the beginning of this project, sort of, uh, you know, making it of interest to Cuban studies. Um, so that that itself has been a bit of a push, and I think it's partly the way, you know, what what the yeah you know, what the sort of primary threads of the Cuban studies have been. Thank you. I'm going to give the the floor to to Miguel Socarra so that he can ask a question. I, I will only say that you know I, I frequently wonder how many people in this country actually know that Guantanamo is in Cuba. That Guantanamo is part of Cuba, and I'm, I'm not sure I know the answer to that. Miguel. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. 
I, I, I like to go back to the first image that was presented because when I saw it, it impressed me tremendously. And probably it impressed me tremendously because I was born and raised in Guantanamo. Mm -hmm. And in 1969, I left Cuba through the base. And my first image of the base was the garita and the wires mm -hmm. and the wire fence. Um, and Guantanamo, the base has a special relationship to the people of the city of Guantanamo mm -hmm. because there is a long history before the revolution because there was a large part of the population that worked there mm -hmm. and commuted. And it was kind of a event every year where the base was open to the citizen of Guantanamo to go and have a, a day of celebration. After, during my adolescence, the base became something else, became a way of escaping mm -hmm. and became also a path of sorrow and sadness because many people were kill or die mm -hmm. attempting to enter into the base. Mm -hmm. So, um, or many people end up in jail. Many of them, uh, teenagers, high school students mm -hmm. that attempted to leave and end up serving prison. So um, the base has a tremendous impact of the, uh, and the people of Guantanamo. Mm -hmm. And uh, that first image to me was very powerful because it somehow represents to me the price that you have to pay, the, what you have to overcome in order to achieve freedom. You have to overcome that wire fence that could cost your life attempting to do it. I just wanted to share that experience with you. Thank you. That's that's really, you know, that that's that's the kind that's a really move, sad moving experience. And I really appreciate you sharing that. And I think it's one of the things that, you know, it's so hard to get at. I mean, I think this is what I think about asymmetrical archives. One of the things I'm thinking about is the hidden archive of of suffering and death uh, that this base has caused. Um, you know, one of the, the title, that piece, the Bertans has had a couple of titles, but one of them is In Memoriam. Um, and yeah, I think, I, I think that title speaks to this sort of hidden suffering there. Um, and I think, you know, another, yeah, and, and it, it's, it seems to me this, that this is a sort of local and hidden history because it's something it's very, very hard to find records on. Um, because uh, you know, there are the, 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 you know, the, the Navy has some records, but, uh, but within Cuba, I think finding actual records on this is, 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 is very, you know, it, it's a sort of, yeah, it, it's difficult. Um, the Cuba Archive Project has records this and there are, um, some of the publications of the Alianza Democrática also have a lot of records of people going to the base, but sort of, you know, official histories is super hard. So, um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah. Okay, so I think we lost him. Lauren? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Esther, for your presentation. I really appreciate that you are focusing on the eastern part of the island. Because a lot of uh, Cuban studies things and sometimes focus only on Havana and, and there is a lack of um, sometimes scholarship on that area on the other side of the island. I mean. So here is my question. Um, you were talking about comparisons, right? Yeah. So I wonder if you're uh, thinking and comparing the cultural productions in terms of like either visual arts or poetry Mm -hmm. uh, or like literature and in Guantanamo before the revolution, right? Yeah. How does that was 
in connection to whether the people that were working for the military base mm. or had relationship with the military base mm. uh, or people that were actually stationed in the military base, right? Versus after, right, 1959. So if you have considered uh, those comparisons, if I know it might be a lot, it might not be feasible in terms of time, um, but I'm wondering if you're thinking about that. And yeah. what would be your approach, I guess? <laughs> yeah, thank you. I, I'm not, I'm not. Um, and I would love to. Um, I think what I'm, no, I, 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 I think that would be, you know, I've, I've read in, you know, other scholars work, you know, particularly Jonathan Hansen's book about, yeah, some of the ways people wrote diaries from the base. Um, you know, I think there would be a lot in terms of um, archival work around Caimanera uh, and the sort of, you know, the sort of interaction there. Um, but it's not something I've done. And I think, you know, I initially started thinking about this as a post 2002 project um, because it was so striking to me that this could be the site of so much. Um, I am thinking, you know, I do want to think about the Balseros as Cubans living in that space. Um, and it's a bit of a stretch, um, but it's something I'm, I'm sort of thinking about in terms of ways uh, Guantanamo is linked to the future. Um, you know, they actually, they have a publication and it's, the Balseros had a publication that was called El Futuro and it's in the, um, in the archives of Miami um, and in Duke as well. Um, and I'm trying to, so I'm sort of thinking about that, I'm, I'm sending back to that, but I, I haven't thought about the pre-revolutionary period. Um, and, you know, I would love to, but it's not something I can speak to very much, I'm afraid. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think, Holly, let me let John. <clears throat> yes. Ask his question now. Hey, John, it's good to see you. Hi, thank you. Sorry, I have been listening to this while driving, but I'm now <laughs> stopped. <laughs> I, a couple of quick questions, and I hope I didn't, in the driving, miss things that this will be redundant. One is there is a fascinating Cuban film, mm -hmm. which I think is called Guantanamo is Ours, which oh, yes, if yeah. people mm -hmm. don't have it, I'll, uh, I'll mm -hmm. send you later the link. Yeah. It's it gives a very interesting sense from mm -hmm. obviously a semi-official Cuban perspective mm -hmm. on it. The second is that not a lot of people know that Ben Rhodes and Alejandro Castro had basically negotiated a path of returning the territory mm -hmm. to Cuban. Uh, Obama, according to Ben's book, Obama said it was too big a lift at that point, and it was this assumption that Hillary would be the, the successor and it would be a problem for the next president to deal with. But it was, it was a uh, real, it was not too different from Michael Parmley's uh, scenario that he had put together. Yeah. Um, the, mm -hmm. the last thing I wanted to say is that besides all of the historical unequal treaty national reasons that it ought to go back to Cuba, it would be tremendously important economically because it would provide for Eastern Cuba a good deep water accessible port, yeah. uh, would also provide a place that cruise ships could dock mm -hmm. to and people could then easily get to uh, Santiago when the high highway was improved. So it would have a tremendous impact on the uh, always limited economy of Eastern Cuba if the, the territory is returned. Yeah. So. Thank you so much. I, I, I had heard a rumor about the late Obama era, but I didn't, I haven't got any reference for it. So that's, that's mm -hmm. really, really interesting to know. Yeah, I know. It's I'm, in Ben's book. It's in yeah. Ben, yeah, I haven't, I haven't read that, I should look for that. Yeah, um, yeah the, the, the documentary, the Todo Guantanamo Muestra, the Hernando, I'm not sure if it's Calvo Espina, Espina Calvo, but he's, that, that's really, it's quite recent. It's, it's, it's really, I, I've been thinking about that a lot. So thank you for that too, yeah. Okay, Holly. Uh, Oh, um, I'm curious if you, what you think about the announcement in the last week or so about how 
to build more of a refugee facility and, and what that means. Um, in, in 2006, they spent first $16 million and then they upped it another $16 million and they did the foundational work to have a refugee camp for 30,000 on the side of Guantanamo where the airport so it wouldn't be near the, the main population. And then last week or the week before, they said, we need to do infrastructure to have some kind of a large camp for refugees. So um, the distinctions there and what's happening is something I'm curious about. Yeah, I, I, I saw that too. And it was really um, kind of what I saw. And I, I don't know if what I saw reported was on the call for contractors to submit bids for this new migration center at Guantanamo. Um, and what I, 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 it seemed like the numbers were much, the numbers they were asking to accommodate was much smaller than one would actually imagine a migration to need. So every, it looked, everything about it looked very odd. Um, I don't know, you know, what, I, I don't know, you know, I, I, I think if that would, if it were to become that as well, it would add, you know, the, the, the coexistence of a big migration center and a detention center is kind of mind blowing in the sense of what kinds of, uh, you know, what kinds, how many kinds of detention can we accommodate in this little space? But I, yeah, I don't, I don't know much about it, but I know, you know, I'm, I'm sure you know as well, Holly, but you know, Carol Rosenberg there, who was with the Herald and now is with the New York Times has been on this for decades, um, you know, trying to poke out, you know, what exactly is happening. Um, and it's been, you know, been pretty clandestine until, yeah. And I, I, I did see that last week though, but yeah, I, I, I don't know, um, but I did see that. So I'm gonna I'm gonna let Diane ask uh, another question, a final question. We, we, we do need to let Esther uh, rest at some point. Uh, and, but before we go, I'm going to also um, give the floor uh, to our colleague Jorge Nunez, who is with us, so that he can yeah. also offer any comments that he may have. At. Diane, please. I'll give her, um, Esther a rest. I don't have a question. I just <laughs> wanted to I just wanted to remind everybody about the history and it's almost a hundred years since the Platt Amendment and why that base is there and why it has continued through all of this time because the US insisted that if, if, if Cuba wanted us militarily to get out, they had to sign the Platt mm -hmm. Amendment and we're still living with that today. So there's the history, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, Jorge, por favor. Estás todavía con el micrófono apagado. You're muted. Now, no. And uh, now? Now good. Now it's good. Ahora está bien. Okay. Uh, I have another question, Esther. Of course, uh, I'm, I'm glad to be in connection with you and with this group and where you're talking. It has been very, very interesting, you know, because always we learn about. Even I live nearby the naval base. Uh, and in a way, uh, I have been uh, a witness of all because of my age, you know. I was hearing the person who was uh, went out through the base in 1969. I don't remember the name, mm -hmm. and was quite moving. And I think that what it means for him yeah. mm -hmm. um, to see the the garitas and the fence, and you know, mm -hmm. and the exchange between Guantanamo and the Bay uh, are from I think from the beginning of the times when the base was settled in Guantanamo. And even more, at the middle of the 19th century, the exchange between Guantanamo and US yeah. were quite uh, linked because the first railroad was bought by American in 1954 or 56, more or less. Mm -hmm. So uh, the connections are, uh, are very close, I think, in the cultural way, you know. Mm -hmm. And even more, we have uh, at the beginning, the first, at the last, years of the 19th century at the beginning of the century of the this the, the, the 20th century uh the roof of Guantanamo most of them are of zinc and I think that it came for a, a, an American influence it was the, the 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 most outstanding way to put the roof to house yeah. because that is why Guantanamo is in that way I think and some architects used to think that we have also influence for New Orleans 
in the front of the house is making of metal. Mm -hmm. So the connections are more than what we can think. Right. And even uh, before 1959, mm -hmm. uh, there was an exchange mainly in music. We have a great jazz influence mm -hmm. because of many workers in Montana that were musicians, but work in another uh, office in, in the base mm -hmm. that uh, were influenced by the jazz. One of them is uh, Luis Martinez Grignan, one of the most uh, relevant play, uh, piano player in the 40s and in the 50s here in Cuba that makes some uh, relevance apart to a song like a music, but it has jazz influence. Yeah. And some of these uh, points that I would like to, to point to you and to the rest, no, because uh, the connections uh, were brought, you know, in 1959. Mm -hmm. And Gianluca was saying in, 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 in an email that we in Guantanamo used to sing more in Florida or in Key West than in, in the base. And that's true. And uh, I think we have erased mm -hmm. uh, from our living this part of the history and I know that is not true, not, not, not is uh, right, I think, because we have to live with that and to share that and to know more about that. Thanks, Esther. And thank you so much, Jorge. I'm so glad to be able to thank you in person for all you did for me when I was in Guantanamo. I really appreciate it. And thank you very much for being here. So thanks great. to you. It is great that you could join us, uh, yeah, Jorge, really and good. please know that you are always welcome to join us, okay? Mm -hmm. Even if we're not talking about one Thank time, you, Alejandro. We talk about many different things here. You know, when I well, started, whenever you want, I am here. <laughs> okay, we will reach out to you absolutely. Um, you can count on that. You know, when I was a, a young professor of legal history at the University of Havana, one of the things we used to teach in the in the in the legal history was uh, the Treaty of 1934, which is really the one that made the base. Yeah. Um, uh, permanent, uh, you know, it, it, it gave the, the U.S. The, the, the legal right to 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 remain uh, there. So, Cuban Cuban legal scholars and students still read those treaties very carefully, trying to find holes. But uh, so far, with very little luck. So let me let me just say gracias to Esther. Let me just say felicidades por tu trabajo. This is excellent work. It's very good to have you. This is the time to unmute yourself and give her, oh. give her <laughs> a, a, an applause. Thank you. Thank you so much to everybody. It's, it's been really wonderful talking to everybody here. So thanks for the invitation. I appreciate it. And uh, and hopefully we'll see each other soon in another uh, in another event of the Cuba Studies program. Mucha salud. Please be well. Gracias. 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 Gracias.